Hey there, and welcome back to XCOM. My name is Pete, and today we complete another episode of our XCOM Enemy Within Iron Man Impossible walkthrough. Last time we left off after shooting down our first alien UFO, we started researching beam weapons and we purchased four satellites. As a result, our financial situation isn't looking too great right now, but with a bit of luck we can obtain a few more funds in the next mission. So let's head over to Mission Control and start scanning. Commander, we're receiving a transmission from the Council. Coming on screen. And here we are with the first Council mission of the series. In these Council missions you cannot choose where you want to go, instead it's only one mission with a fixed objective and a fixed reward. We are also not forced to take this mission, but we probably should, because the reward is pretty damn good. Not only will we receive a decent amount of cash, but the mission also comes with a panic reduction in Brazil and with a sergeant level sniper. Needless to say, those rewards are more than worth it, so of course we'll take the mission. Excellent. We look forward to seeing your progress. No changes in our lineup, as usual it will be Adam Work, Emilia Solberg, Rosilius Wargal and Andrea Cook. Brazilian authorities have requested our help, so that's where we're going next. The objectives for this one are then fairly straightforward. We need to find a VIP and extract him, alive of course. So technically we don't even need to kill all enemies to complete the mission and we also don't have any melt containers on the map, so we can take it a bit more slowly. UN official Peter Van Dorn and his entourage were caught in an explosion that decimated a nearby bridge, and we're picking up hostiles converging on the area. We need you to confirm Mr. Van Dorn is still alive and bring him back safe before the whole place is overrun. New objective received. Hey, Friendly's over here. Now, the guy over there is not the VIP, but he marks the spot to where we can normally advance without uncovering any hostiles, and since the area further down is slightly lowered, we can dash in this first turn without much risk. There's a team here to get Van Dorn, right? He ran up ahead to find one of our men who got caught in the blast when those freaks at the bridge. Look, we're in no shape to take those things out. If you can go grab Van Dorn, we'll get you back to your aircraft. We also receive a rough first location of the VIP now, but the area around him is still hidden in the fog of war. In the next turn we then move up Adam and uncover the first enemy of the map. This is a thin man, a type of alien with high accuracy and the ability to spit poison, so it's a good idea to take it out before it can do any damage. However, since we have quite a bit of distance between us and the enemy, we'll have Adam return to his original position and put everyone else on overwatch. Such an overwatch trap is an effective way of dealing with isolated enemies like this, as it forces them to come to you, but of course you give up a bit of control over the situation. And the trap works like a charm, but unfortunately of our three shooters only Resilius finds his target, and so it's now the thin man's turn. Its shot against Emilia goes wide though, and so we can now use Adam's run and gun ability to make quick work of the alien. You the ops team? Get over here! We have a new objective. We also make contact with the VIP, but let's stay focused on the thin man for now. Adam's shot hits, the thin man explodes in a cloud of poison, and we should avoid stepping through here for the moment, otherwise our soldiers will become poisoned and lose hit points. With no more enemies inside around Adam, we can once again dash with the rest of the squad, and Emilia can actually run straight through the poison, she carries the medikit and is therefore immune. Orders confirmed. On the move. Nothing happens on the alien's turn and the VIP is pushing us to come and rescue him. Get down here. Not fair if I have all the fun. But there might be aliens down there, so we'll take it slow. Adam moves up and my hunch was correct, as we now reveal the first of three groups of sectoids. Now we could of course solve this one quickly with a rocket from Andrea, but we might need that one later. Luckily we also have the high ground here, so the alien's cover won't be all that useful. So even against half cover, Adam has a 90% hit chance with a shotgun, and I would say let's take that shot. I'm about to 
start keeping score. And that's the first kill, so let's continue with Emilia, who has a decent 70% chance. I'll get him next time. Her shot goes wide though, so we can now try with Andrea. He's down. She kills sectoid number 2, and because we picked the bullet swarm trade, her turn is not over yet. That means, despite having fired already, she can still throw a grenade, and with Resilius only able to use his pistol next, I think that's a smart choice. If the sectoid isn't killed, it will have to move, otherwise the car explosion will take it down, but let's see if Mr. Wargal can take care of it first. And that's it, two points of damage, the first nest is taken out. Once again, the VIP is urging us to move, but for some reason we can also spot a sectoid over on the ledge on the other side. It belongs to a group that hasn't activated yet, but as soon as we move with Emilia, that changes. Aye, aye, Eyes on target. We have only uncovered two sectoids this time, and both of them have moved out of sight, but we can't come any closer without stepping down and giving them the high ground, so let's be patient for now, we can overwatch with Amelia and Roselius while Adam and Andrea reload their weapons. We're green to go. Heading there now. Reloaded. Of course, the aliens are not stupid either and stay up on their ledge, so on the next turn we can switch things around. This time Emilia and Roselius can reload, while Adam and Andrea can overwatch. Adam can also move a bit closer to the VIP, because as always, he will be our runner. Once again, the aliens don't engage, however, considering their position, they are almost guaranteed to be on overwatch, so moving down to the VIP is risky. On the other hand, we also don't want to sit here trading overwatches for half an hour, so let's take the safest path with Andrea, down the ladder and immediately behind full cover. That triggers the third and final nest, once again two sectoids, but luckily it does not trigger a reaction shot. And that means there are no aliens on Overwatch up there, which is surprising, but it allows Adam to dash down to the VIP to complete our current objective. Thank God you're here. I'm still breathing, but I can't say the same for a lot of my boys. Let's get out of here before any more of those things show up. Commander. We should get the VIP back to the Sky Ranger as soon as possible. Right, so all we have to do to finish the mission is to extract the VIP, but of course, that's easier said than done, and taking out the aliens first is a good idea, although not required. Since Andrea can't do much on this turn, she will hunker down, and the VIP, who we can control now, will do the same. Everyone else will stay on Overwatch. The aliens once again don't find a target, but we now have three of them grouped closely together, and you know what that means, time for a rocket. Going hot. Triple kill for Andrea Cook, but there's still one sectoid left, so we won't take any chances. The VIP hunkers down again, and Emilia throws a smoke grenade to obscure Andrea and make her harder to hit. Popping smoke! With Adam, we might want to use a run and gun on the next turn, so we'll have him inch a bit closer, but keep him in full cover and on Overwatch. Got it. Strike one. You've got a wave of X-rays closing on your location. Eyes up. Taking fire over here. The sectoid shot misses, and we are now informed of enemy reinforcements. However, those are dependent on the VIP's movement, not on our troops. Of course, it's advisable to keep all of them close together, but we can use this mechanic to set up a good front line while the VIP remains put until we are in position. For now though, we still have a lone sector to deal with, and even though it's a bit hard to see here, Adam can dash into a flanking position, so let's use run and gun to do that, and then take the shot. Wonderful, that's the last sectoid of the mission taken out, time to regroup everyone as we now prepare for the trip back to the Sky Ranger. Enemy forces headed your way, Strike One. Get ready. 
Since we moved the VIP, we also have a Thin Man drop in on the alien's turn, but the landing alone is enough to trigger three overwatches. Rosilius then lands the killing blow and we can move everyone up a few steps. And even though we use a few overwatches, we don't need to be overly cautious here. Again, new aliens will only drop if we move the VIP, who stays right where he is on this turn. Over the next two turns, we then move everyone behind heavy cover and form an excellent overwatching frontline. And now, and only now, will we move the VIP. Just received some intel that hostiles are advancing on your location. Ready up. As expected, two more thin men drop down immediately, but we are well prepared. However, neither one gets killed and both are now on Overwatch themselves, so we have to be a bit careful here. On the right side we have a good flanking shot with Adam, but he's also the one holding the emergency option, namely one of only two grenades we have left, so let's try with Amelia first. Her shot goes wide though, so let's use the grenade for a guaranteed kill. On the left, we also have one more grenade on Resilius, but he's not quite in range to hit the Thin Man. Andrea could in theory shoot twice with a 48% chance to hit, but she's low on ammo and has only one volley left. We could get her in a flanking position, but that would require running through the Thin Man's overwatch, and that could kill her instantly and is therefore not an option. So instead, we'll move her out of the line of fire and reload, while the VIP keeps his head down and Resilius goes on overwatch, just in case the Thin Man moves closer. The Thin Man, however, uses its Poison Spit on Assault Adam Work. Now, Poison Spit is very likely to be used against enemies in full cover or against enemies grouped closer together. It does not inflict any direct damage, instead it poisons units who lose one hit point every turn for at least three turns. The Poison Cloud will also remain around Adam, so we should not move anyone over to him. Now, luckily, the Thin Man can't go on Overwatch after spitting poison, so we can now safely move Andrea into a flanking position and take the shot. And that's a critical, and so we once again have no more hostiles present. As a result, we can now reload Resilius' sniper rifle and also take care of Adam's poisoning. After all, Emilia has a medikit and using it on Adam will not only restore the hit point he has lost, but also cure him of the poison's effects. Once again, the VIP won't move until we have established a good overwatch position, but it takes only one more turn until we have. And then, despite moving the VIP, no new aliens join the party, so it seems like we have defeated them all, but one can never be too careful, so let's keep the VIP in cover and everyone in overwatch on the next turn as well. Again though, no aliens in sight, and so we can now move the VIP to the extraction zone and complete the mission. I owe you one. Seriously. I wouldn't be here without your help. Executed to the numbers, strike one. Get back here on the double. And that's it. All 11 enemies have been killed. The VIP survived without a scratch. Time to return to XCOM HQ. Impressive work, Commander. Our soldiers have to be feeling good after a mission like that. And because one reward for this mission was a sergeant level soldier, we unlocked the officer training school, a facility where we can unlock a few very useful upgrades for our squad, such as an increased squad size or more experience points per alien kill. We also received promotions for every single member of our squad, including another one for Andrea, who is now a sergeant as well. But let's start at the top with support Emilia Solberg. <laughs> As usual, we have two choices here, Sprinter and Covering Fire. Sprinter allows Emilia to move three more tiles and that is per movement, so with a full dash she can cover six more tiles per turn. Covering Fire then upgrades Overwatch, so that the ability also triggers on enemy attacks, no longer just on movement. However, I want to turn Emilia into our dedicated medic and utility soldier, and the movement range bonus is a bit more useful in that role. 
The next support will likely be a bit more offensive minded, but in the early game it's good to have at least one capable medic on hand. Moving on, we have Sniper Resilius Wargal, and his ability choices are Snapshot and Squad Sight. Snapshot allows Resilius to fire his sniper rifle after moving, but not after dashing and for the price of a small aim penalty, while Squad Sight allows Resilius to fire at enemies that he can technically not see, as long as they are in an alley side radius and he has a clear line of fire. And that is also the ability we will go with here. With this ability, we can take a big step towards removing Resilius from the front lines while keeping him a deadly asset. Snapshot is a bit more versatile, while Squad Side can make Resilius become rather stationary, which can be risky, but if we keep an eye on him and avoid separating him too much from the group, it's a very useful ability. Up next, we have Assault Adam Work, and for him, we have the choice between Tactical Sense and Aggression. Tactical Sense gives a plus 5 defense bonus per enemy in sight, up to a maximum of plus 20, and Aggression is the offensive equivalent to that, with a plus 10 critical hit chance per enemy in sight, up to a maximum of plus 30. Both options are very solid, but since it's still early in the game and we don't have access to some of the higher tier armors yet, we'll take all the protection we can get. Adam is usually getting very close to his enemies anyway, so he has no problem landing critical hits, and being so close, this bonus should also apply very often. It also neatly stacks with the cross of Jared, which already gives a plus 5 defense bonus when in cover. Last but not least then, Heavy Andrea Cook, the choices here are Shredder Rocket and Suppression. The Shredder Rocket is a projectile similar to the normal rocket, but all enemies that are hit take increased damage for the next 4 turns, at the cost of reduced damage from the rocket itself. Suppression on the other hand imposes a big aim penalty, pins down a target and allows reaction fire similar to Overwatch. It works very nicely in combination with holo targeting, however we did not pick that with Andrea. Instead we chose Bullet Swarm and we will also go with the Shredder Rocket here. Once again, as a standalone ability, it is simply a bit more powerful, still able to one-shot sectoids, and without holo targeting, suppression would never reach its full potential anyway. Now, another reward for this mission is the International Service Cross, which is unlocked because this was the third continent we completed a mission on. Because in total it was mission number 4, we also received the second cross of Jared, a third and final one will follow after mission number 7. Our loot for this one then consists of corpses of both Sectoids and Thin Man, as well as of a decent amount of weapon fragments. Here we can also see a summary of all rewards, we receive cash and a panic reduction in Brazil, and a new sniper joins our squad. That sniper is of course incredibly useful, but the cash reward also comes at the perfect time, and even the panic reduction is pretty convenient, I'll show you why in just a second. Remember, we will be watching. For now, we can say hello to our newest squad member, but of course not before we assign a name from the Patreon naming rights tier. Alright, here we are, welcome to the XCOM project, George Teasdale. I have also selected the nickname Darklight from the naming rights tier, and Andrea received a new one as well, she now goes by Astro. But George is the man of the hour, and we can level him up not once, but twice, so let's get to it. On the corporal level, we once again have access to Snapshot and Squad Side, and since Resilius already received Squad Side, we'll go with Snapshot for George. So he will be slightly more mobile, but he also has to be, as he can only fire at targets that he can actually see. On the sergeant level, we can now choose between Gunslinger and Damn Good Ground. Gunslinger gives a damage bonus to shots fired with the pistol, while Damn Good Ground improves the already existing bonuses from having an elevated position. Now, not all maps have easily accessible high grounds, but I still prefer this ability over Gunslinger simply because it focuses on the sniper's primary weapon. Yes, with the right build, a pistol-wielding sniper can actually be pretty powerful as well, but this early in the game, it's probably better to focus on things that are useful with the sniper's more traditional playstyle. With everyone leveled up, we can now also assign our medals, and let's start with the second cross of Jared. The bonus is locked in, so just like the first one, it will give a plus 5 defense bonus when in cover. Adam cannot receive it because he already has one, but I think Andrea has earned it. After 4 missions, she is our kill leader and the first sergeant in our squad, so let's reward that with the cross of Jared.
Now, the International Service Cross will of course not keep that name. Instead, we will name it the Demagistor Medal after another patron in the naming rights tier. For the medal's powers, we can choose between a plus 2 will bonus per different nationality in the squad or a plus 2 aim bonus per unlocked continent bonus. And this one is a no-brainer in my opinion. Our goal is of course to obtain as many continent bonuses as possible, while carefully managing squad member nationalities, which have absolutely no other use in the game just for the sake of a small will bonus, is definitely not a sensible idea. Now, since we're dealing with an aim bonus, we will of course give this to the sharpshooter in our squad, and yes, I'm talking about Resilius Wargal. George Teasdale would also be a solid target, I think, but he simply hasn't proven himself yet. Let us now also quickly jump over to the Situation Room and take a look at the Panic Levels. We can see here that thanks to this Council mission, Brazil is down to Panic Level 1. And that means we could in theory ignore an abduction mission in Brazil without the country panicking. And that is because the panic increase from an ignored abduction mission is plus 3, normally enough to send a country to 5, but with the reduction we have some room. And that's all we can take care of for the moment, so let's return to mission control and continue scanning. Alright, on the 17th of March we finish construction of our very first workshop and unlock the AND practice achievement. The new engineers arrived this morning, Commander. We're always glad to have more help down here. As a result, we now have more than 10 engineers and that allows us to build our second satellite uplink. That one is necessary to launch all the satellites at the end of the month, but as you can see, that uplink costs 100 credits, so had we not received the cash bonus from the council mission, we would now be forced to sell what we have left in corpses and items to increase our funds. Luckily, we have enough cash, so that's not necessary, and we can in fact spend a little extra, because we have no more building projects planned in this month. We have 30 credits left and that is enough to purchase a scope, a very useful item in the early game as it offers a nice plus 10 aim bonus. And there is one guy who could become absolutely lethal with such an upgrade and I am of course once again talking about Sniper Resilius Wargal. The scope works very well with his metal and the squad side ability. As you can see it increases his aim from a 78 to an 88, however at the cost of the grenade slot. But with Heavy Andrea Cook now being able to fire both a regular and a shredder rocket, we should be fine when it comes to explosives. And I think that's all we can do for today. If we continue scanning, we will very likely run into the next abduction mission and that one will be part of the next video. So we will make the cut right here. As always, I hope you enjoyed the episode and if you did, then I would be happy if you could leave a thumbs up. If you want to support me and my channel further, then you can of course subscribe if you haven't already, or you can check out and maybe pledge to the Pete Complete Patreon. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.